Hello everyone, and amongst us we have Justice Hari A. Prashad, and who is a former judge from Kerala High Court, now a designated senior, who is practicing not only in the Supreme Court and the other parts of the state. We have taken a lot of sessions with him, and today he would be explaining the nuances of co-ownership. And thank you, sir, for accepting our invite. Over to you. Thank you, thank you, my dear friend Gus. See the concept co-ownership is of uh, great importance uh, across the length and breadth of our country because questions relating to partition directly emanate from ownership. So we will see what are the, the classifications and uh, the different types of ownership that is conceivable in our country. Now, before going into the subject, I think uh, it is better to understand the fundamental principle that ownership consists of a bundle of rights over some property. Now, that is the concept called ownership. It gives to the owner some claims, privileges, powers, and of course, immunities and limitations. These may vary according to the nature of the property over which the ownership is claimed. So, uh, it depends on the nature of the property. The ownership is a bundle of rights having various privileges, powers, and immunities. Now, going by the definition of uh, jurist Austin, ownership is a right over a determinate thing, indefinite in point of user, unrestricted in point of disposition, and unlimited in point of duration. This is the definition. But this definition normally is applicable to the uh, absolute ownership. It's not in respect of a limited ownership. Because as all of us know, Ownership is a concept which is of limited ownership because when two or more persons have ownership in respect of the same subject matter, then only we call it a ownership. So the the ownership in the uh, going by the Austin's definition, it is sold uh, the ownership of a person, sold owner of the property. But there is a slight distinction in the case of ownership. Then the main facets or rather the predominant features of ownership are one right to possession that is very important because there is a saying that uh, possession right to possess is nine points in law so right to possession right to enjoy and right to dispose so these are the fundamental rights available to an owner of a property right to possession right to enjoy and right to dispose now these are the this is applicable in the case of sole ownership as well as in co-ownership then, if an owner of a property, I am speaking about immobile property for the time being. If the owner of an immobile property is wrongfully dispossessed, or even an owner of a pro immobile property is wrongfully dispossessed, he has a right to get it repossessed or recovery of possession possible. But an absolute sole owner of a property, if he so desires, can share his interest with some other person. That is, I mean, suppose a, a one acre of property exclusively belongs to one individual and he decides to sell half of his right over the entire one acre of property, not 50 cents by partition. The entire property, his half right is sold to a second person. Then he becomes a co-owner with the original sold owner and that way he can create a derivative right. Then. In other words, suppose a person is the complete owner in the legal sense, absolute owner. Probably the expression absolute owner requires some clarification. There is nothing absolute in law. But then for the time being, let us assume that he has all the power conceivable in respect of all the powers conceivable in respect of the property. Then he can, uh, if he holds the property by himself, he is the sole owner. There is no question of ownership. But he may decide to, as I told you earlier, he may decide to uh, give away a portion of his right, say half or one third or one fourth, whatever it is. If it is transferred to one person or other persons, then he becomes a co-owner along with the transferees. In the other way around, suppose he creates a lease, mortgage, license, whatever it is, uh, that is called uh, the derivative right because then, then there is a concept called a superior right and an inferior right. 
So if that is created, it is not a cornership. It is actually another dual relationship of a, 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 an absolute right on one person and a derivative right in respect of the other persons. So the difference between cornership and derivative right is that in the case of cornership, the the what you call the the interest transferred by one person to another person is a coordinate interest. Coordinate interest means at the same level, not a superior or an inferior. In the same level, coordinate interest when it is transferred, the transfer is called a owner along with the original owner. And if a derivative right like lease, mortgage, etc., is cre are created, then the the uh, the holder of the property is called having a superior right, and the when the, the for whom it is transferred will have a uh, smaller right or rather an inferior right, which is called a derivative right. So that is the essential distinction between ownership on one hand and derivative rights on the other hand. Then assume that A is the owner of a parcel of land. He dies, leaving behind uh, his wife and children. The moment he dies, the property right which was available with A devolves on the legal heirs. So that devolves according to the shares claimable under the personal law. Hindus according to Hindu Succession Act, Muslims according to their personal law, Christians according to Indian Succession Act, whatever it is. So whatever personal law applicable to them, the property of the deceased owner devolves on the uh, legal heirs and they becomes, the moment they becomes co-owners. Similarly, suppose uh, two persons or three persons purchase property by pooling their resources. They are not uh, related by blood or they are, they are total strangers, assume. Suppose three persons who are total strangers purchase property by contributing different sums. Going by certain the, the provision in the TP Act, you will find your type, your uh, this entitlement to property will depend upon the price, uh, the share in the price that you have paid. Suppose one person pays uh, 1 lakh, the other person pays uh, 60,000, the other person pays 40,000, altogether 2 lakhs and uh, they purchase a property. Then their share interest may be different in the property. So the person who has paid the maximum amount will have a higher right than the middleman, than the lowest person. So uh, in that case, even though their shares are different, shares in the property are different, they are corners because there is no rule that uh, each corner should have the same uh, interest in the subject matter of the cornership. That is another principle. Then, in theory, every corner is assumed to be the uh, entire, uh, is assumed to be the owner of the entire property. Otherwise, every corner has all the rights and privileges in respect of the property that can be claimed by the, if he had been the sole owner of the property. That is why we will go later. There are certain extensions possible. I am just telling you the principles for the time being. So fundamental test of cornership is whether they have coordinate interest. Coordinate interest, I will explain once more. It is interest in the same level, having the uh, same nature. It is not a derivative, uh, it is not a derivative right. It is neither a superior right nor an inferior right. At the same level, so the fundamental test is to determine determine whether there is a cornership or not is to find out whether there is a coordinate interest. If the interest of one is subordinate or higher in degree than the other, there is no cornership between the parties. So that is why I again explain there is no cornership between lessor and lessee. There is no cornership, cornership between mortgagor and mortgagee because their rights are at two different tiers. But uh, suppose two brothers inherit from their father their interests are the same. So they are having coordinate interest. That is the main incident of ownership. Now, uh, generally we use joint property. Joint property is a loose expression where you can have ownership and you can have uh, uh, this uh, joint tenancy. You can have co -parsonary. These are all joint property, but ownership is a special feature of that uh, joint property. Now, straight away, we will go to the forms of co-ownership. 
that can be conceived in our country. One, that well, first one is joint tenancy. Second one is tenancy in common or co-ownership in the uh, normal uh, usage. Then comes co-parsonary. So these are the three types of uh, varieties of co-ownership or rather joint ownership possible in this country. First one is joint tenancy, then tenancy in common and then co-parsonary. Joint tenancy is a concept where the joint tenants form one body owning the properties. That is, they they are the they are they are, they are, collectively they are one body owning the properties. Now, actually, uh, joint tenancy is said to be distinguished by four unities. There are the characteristics of joint tenancy is different from that of the ownership. We will see what is what are the characteristics of joint tenancy. Unity of possession. Unity of possession is essential because every joint owner is presumed to be in possession of the property. It's a it's an extended uh, what you call even if one joint owner is staying away, the other holding as in the case of ownership, the other holding the property is presumed to be holding it for and on behalf of the other joint tenants. So unity of possession first thing. Then unity of interest. Their interests are also originate from the same source. Their interests are the same. So there is unity of interest. Then unity of uh, uh, title. They have unity. They have the same title. It is not a derivative title. All the joint, joint owners have the same nature, same extent, right in respect of title. Then and unity of the time of commencement of such title because it's a legal fiction. So the, the commencement of title also takes place in respect of the joint tenants at the same time. So there are four unities in the case of joint tenancies. One, unity of possession, unity of interest, unity of title and unity of the commencement of such title. I'll, I'll just explain. Suppose uh, a, a person who is bound, who is uh, governed by Hindu Succession Act. Uh, of course, there is an amendment. I remember that I, there is an amendment to Section Six of the Hindu Succession Act, including the daughters as co-partners in the co-partnery. Assume a case before the amendment, which was in two thousand one or so. I don't remember the date of amendment. Anyway, recent amendment within one or two decades. Before that, let us say two thousand five. If I remember correctly. Now, before that, suppose a person dies. A, co a, a co partner Hindu co partner dies. So, if the, when the rule of survivorship was there, the uh, the property owned by the person will devolve on his uh, this persons entire persons entitled to uh, the the right according to the principles of Section Six of the Hindu Succession Act as one unit. So, suppose there are three uh, persons claim uh, claiming his right, or rather entitled to claim his right, then the right originally belong to the deceased Hindu co partner will devolve on the three persons uh, in equal proportion at the same time. So there is a creation of a joint tenancy in respect of the right to the deceased person. So there are there are four unities satisfied. One unity of possession, then unity of uh, uh, interest, unity of title and unity of time of commencement of title because the title commences the moment he dies. So this, these are the concepts relating to joint tenancy. Then in the case of a joint tenant, they also have a right to joint possession. Every, every joint tenant is presumed to be in possession of the property for and on behalf of other joint tenants. But in the case of joint tenancy, uh, as distinguished from the ownership, each joint tenant will have the same interest because if one is having one fourth, all the other persons will be having one fourth right. So there cannot be a varied interest in the property. Um, but in the case of ownership, the principle is different. And uh, as I explained earlier, the joint tenants' right uh, is a, uh, rights are accrued to them from the same source. The source is also the same because they derive right from a person or rather from uh, from an, a happening. This from the same source they derive, but in the case of ownership, the right can uh, emanate from various sources. That is the difference. I'll explain when I deal with the ownership. And lastly, 
each one of them should acquire interest in the property at the same time because the devolution of interest in the case of a joint tenant in the case of joint tenants happens at the same time now coming to corners tenancy in common the difference is that the ownership does not require all the four requisites as in the case of joint tenancy because uh, possession is a common ingredient for both joint tenancy as well as for uh, tenancy in common but uh, there is no rule or there is it is not required in the case of uh, ownership that there should be unity of right or unity of title and uh, sorry unity of interest unity of title and unity of time of commencement of title these these three ingredients are not required in the case of ownership i shall explain suppose i have a property say 1 acre of property i decide to sell uh, uh, see uh, one third right each to two different persons so i retain my one third right over the property and i sell one third each to two separate persons assume that i am selling one third right to b or to a today so i'll be retaining two third right over the property and uh, uh, a will get one third right as on today then after say six months i sell my one third right for, uh, again i sell one third right to b b then b will get a one third right after six months so there is no identity of time uh, time factor is not there for either the commencement of title uh, does not depend on single time it at different times it happens so still there is a partnership i i have a uh, one third right the other two persons have one third right each so there is no rule in the case of partnership that the title should commence at the same point of time and as in the case of joint tenancy i told you earlier the joint tenants must have equal right in respect of the uh, the the property concerned but in the case of partnership there is no rule that everyone should have a same interest suppose i i sell one tenth right over my property to a person i'll be retaining 9 by 10 and the 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 bendy will get only 1 by 10 still we are corners so different shares possible in the case of ownership uh the the uh, other aspect regarding ownership is that uh, even if even if the the corner uh, is not in a possession of the entire property or even if he does not have the entire right of the property he is presumed in law to be the absolute owner of the property for all practical purposes for example uh, suppose somebody is trying to trespass upon the property one corner can file a suit against the 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 the, the, the what about apprehending trespass against the person who is likely to trespass upon the property for an injunction or other release uh, as law may uh, require in this case that uh, uh, the property should be protected so he has every right to uh, see that it is enjoyed in a manner as if he is the full owner of the property that is one incident of ownership then before coming to other aspects of ownership let me explain coparsonary also no coparsonary is a concept even available in english common law principle because we are we speak coparsonary uh, mainly in the context of hindu law pristine hindu law but even in under english system coparsonary is uh, recognized but there is a slight distinction between hindu coparsonary and uh, the english concept of coparsonary coparsonary arose in english common law wherever land descended to two or more persons who together constituted an heir as in the case of our coparsonary also the entire right devolved on coparsoners was originally belonging to one individual from one individual we they trace their right to uh, uh, to claim ownership over the property coparsoners constitute a single heir and they occupy a position intermediate between joint tenants and tenants in common so coparsonary in english law is a position between joint tenants on one hand and tenancy in common on the other hand because tenancy in common we have seen uh, it need not be under the what you call under the same interest at the same point of time the title need not commence there are distinctions 
in the case of joint tenancy also even there are four unities required but uh, english common law says that it is the coparsonary under the english concept is something in between joint tenancy and tenancy in common now coming to hindu mitakshara coparsonary the principle is slightly different because as we know um, the coparsonary is recognized under hindu law when all persons the, when the coparsoners are lineally descended from a common ancestor, then only the coparsonary will be recognized under Hindu law. And uh, you know, coparsonary is uh, actually it is a uh, it's a statutory prescription. Coparsonary is formed by operation of law. It can't be created by contract between the parties. It's a natural thing happens under the uh, under the the relevant law applicable to the parties. Then, the expression Hindu joint family has to be understood in the context that it, it takes in not only co-passners, but also all the female members, minor members, those who are removed uh, three degrees away from the, uh, the acquirer of the property. So, all the, all the members in the family collectively are called joint family and the co normally, according to Hindu law, uh, being the sons, grandsons and great grandsons of the holder of the joint property for the time being. So coparsonary or three generation sons, grandsons and great grandsons of the holder of the joint family property for the time being. So that is the distinction between joint family and coparsonary. Then of course if you if anybody is interested in understanding these concepts please refer to AER 1962 Supreme Court 287. A year 1962 Supreme Court 287, A year 1985 Supreme Court 716. You will get the concepts clear regarding the co-personary. Because you will find a lot of litigations in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the context of income tax laws. Then, according to Hindu law, there can be a joint family with a single co-personer provided there are other members entitled to maintenance from the estate. Because if the sole person cannot be a co partner if there are other females, other members in the joint family, though there are no other co partners still a co partner can be, there can be a joint family possible. Please see 1970, AER 1970, Supreme Court 343, sorry, AER 1970, Supreme Court 343. Then, even the death of the sole surviving co partner does not necessarily put an end to the family because so the co-partner, uh, suppose he survived, joint family cannot be finally brought to an end. While it is possible in the nature of law to add a male member to it. For example, if adoption is possible, then uh, if in the joint family, suppose there is an adoption, legal, legally valid adoption takes place of a male, then the co-partner can continue. So these are all some broad concepts, maybe not very relevant for the, in the present day context, but I am just telling you the principles to understand what exactly the distinction between co-ownership and the uh, co -personal. Then, so going back to the subject, co-ownership co ne need not be between the family members, even strangers can be co-owners. Uh, co Suppose a Hindu, a Muslim and a Christian together buy property, uh, uh, by property, uh, by uh, what you call pooling their resources, then it's a co-ownership. It can't be a joint family or it can't be a co-personary or uh, uh, it can't be a joint tenancy also because joint tenancy commences by devolution from one source, common source. So, th so this can be a co-ownership. It cannot be the other two concepts called joint tenancy or co-personary. Then, then what are the rights inter se between the co-owners? Now, let us see whether there is an agency possible. One co-owner can be, whether he can be presumed to be an agent of other co-owners. The law says that uh, merely as a co-owner, one person is not an agent for other co-owners. He is not an agent for other co-owners. But a co-owner may be, may be an agent for others by any authority. Suppose there is an express or implied authorization given to one co-owner to act as the agent of other co-owners, then of course an agency is created by either by contract or by this uh, uh, what you call act of 
the parties who uh, act at the corner who is authorized to act, uh, act on behalf of others. As, as I told you earlier, one corner for protecting the interest of himself and of others can file a suit for uh, preserving the property for injunction, recovery of possession, whatever it is required. He can file it on behalf of others. Only thing is that in the plane, he shall aver that uh, apart from him, such and such other persons are also having a right because he can't uh, file a suit uh, or he, he can file a suit but then the other corners are not bound by his suit if he makes an government in the plane that he is the sole owner of the property. Uh, I shall explain because suppose there is a hostile assertion against other corners and he claims exclusive ownership of the property. Then the difficulty is that other the decree therein is not binding, will not bind the other corners. Uh, uh, maybe even the stranger, the, the defendant in the suit even can dispute that you are not the sole owner of the property. That's it. This is a debatable proposition. However, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in other cases where the, the, uh, the cornership, uh, whether, the, the, whether the person, the corner in possession, in order to preserve the property, files a suit for and on behalf of other corners without negating their right, such a suit is maintainable and there is a kind of agency uh, uh, presumable under that situation. Then, whether a corner is a trustee for other corners, that question also arises and decided in very many cases. You will find some decisions by the Supreme Court and other high courts. A corner, merely as a corner, is not to be a, not to be regarded as a trustee for other corners. There is no fiduciary relationship as such as provided under the Indian Trust Act. But Chapter 9 of Indian Succession Act 1882 enumerates several cases in which obligation in the nature of a trust is created. It is not a real trust in the in the in stricto sense, but obligations in the nature, if you refer to sections 90, 94, 95, etc., you will find uh, the Indian Trust Act says relationship uh, in the nature of akin to uh, uh, trust. Of course, those con concepts may come into play, but there is no actual uh, what you call express trust created uh, by uh, for the actions of one corner for uh, for and on behalf of others the position therefore seems to be that as between the corners in a joint estate there is hardly any relationship of a fiduciary nature but if any corner by abuse of his position as such gains an advantage it is not only proper that he should not be allowed to enjoy the advantage to the exclusion of the others now that this principle is called disgorging the benefits. Suppose a corner, by virtue of management of the cornership property, acquires some benefits or advantages, uh, then he is liable to uh, account for the say, account the, the profits or rather the benefit that he has derived to the other corners and there must be a sharing of profit. That is the settled law of this. Then, if you speak on uh, what you call uh, adverse possession, limitation and ouster, that itself is a long subject, large subject, but I'll just make a mention that a corner's possession in law is presumed to be for and on, on, on behalf of other corners. There is no hostility pres presumed by law unless it is uh, specifically pleaded and proved in a litigation between the corners and one corner claiming absolute ownership over the cornership property by uh, adverse possession, limitation and ouster, it is for him to plead and prove that he had excluded uh, to the knowledge of the ousting corners that he is the absolute owner of the property. So that's a different subject by itself. So in principle, there is that the law presumes that every corner is in possession for and on behalf of other corners. It is for the person who asserts an independent right to plead and prove. That is the principle. Then, another right available to corners is that he is entitled to claim contributions for the improvement of the property. That is the general principle. But uh, that principle is subject to certain conditions. You can't uh, suppose a corner voluntarily improves without uh, the without asking permission or without the concurrence or without even informing the other corners. He voluntarily out of his he gratuitously does it then probably he may not be able to claim it 
if there is a dispute between the other corner between himself and other corners but uh, if in in the following three conditions uh, in a corner improving the property or doing good things for the property to increase the value of the property can claim reimbursement when three things are in existence. One, if there is an express contract for such improvement and then uh, there is a decision for contribution to the person who is doing this for the benefit of the property, there must be an express contract for contribution. Two, if the money was spent at the express or implied request of other corners, if there is a specific request, either express or implied, from other corners to improve the property, then the improving corner is entitled to get contribution. And three, if the case uh, falling under section 70 of the Indian Contract Act is made out, then also he is entitled to get uh, uh, reimbursement or rather contribution for the uh, uh, proportionate contribution from other corners. Under Section 70 of the Indian Contract Act, there are three situations. Work done should, should not be unlawful. 70 says you can't claim contribution if the work done is unlawful. So it must not be unlawful activity. Then, uh, second one, that he should not have intended to do the work gratuitously. <clears throat> Suppose the corner does a gratuitous act, then there is no question of claiming contribution. Then three, that the other corners should have enjoyed the benefits of improvement. Suppose they have enjoyed the other corners uh, by act of the, the improving corner uh, have benefited and they enjoyed the benefit, then of course he, they are morally and legally bound to uh, pay contribution to the person who caused the improvement. So these are the situations. So contributions generally, if it is voluntary, uh, gratuitously and without uh, either against the wish of the other corners or without asking them, then the corner is not entitled to get contribution. But in other situations, he may be entitled to get contribution for improving the cornership property. Then, suppose the corner uh, discharges a common liability. Suppose there is a liability on the estate, on the property, and three owners are there. One corner out of his pocket clears the debt. So, there is a revenue re recovery proceedings or some, some liability on the property. One corner uh, discharges the liability. Certainly, he is entitled to get uh, contribution from other corners who are benefited by this man's uh, act. So these are the concepts regarding cornership uh, uh, in uh, the, the in the real practice life experience. These are the these are the uh, characteristics of this right. And uh, we have seen three different types of cornership conceivable in India: joint tenancy, tenancy in common, and co-partnership. This tenancy in common is known as co-ownership. Joint tenancy is, uh, as I told you earlier, there are four unities which is not required in the case of ownership or tenancy in common. And the coparsonary under English law is different from Hindu coparsonary. And Hindu coparsonary, of course, uh, the, the wider definition as of now, because the Act has been, Hindu Succession Act has been amended uh, and it takes in doctors also. Coparsonary right is uh, uh, in respect of persons have. Uh, Remove three degrees from the uh, joint uh, holder of the property. And uh, these are the incidents. I think, Mr. Vikas, we will stop it here. And if there is any question, probably I can answer now. Yes, sir. I think it couldn't have been explained in a much better way than what you've explained. I'm just taking a few questions that have come on the WhatsApp. Is there any concept of absolute ownership, co-ownership? Okay, I, I'll, I'll explain that because I told you at the outset that uh, absolute ownership, if you go to any, any uh, this what you call it, say, Salman on jurisprudence or any standard textbook on jurisprudence, you will find that nothing is absolute in this world. The whole world is imperfect. So we, the, the concept called absolute ownership is only a misnomer. It actually, uh, assume that I have one acre of property. I, I can't do it and I can't uh, enjoy the property in my own way without with, uh, disregarding the entire laws relating to the enjoyment of property. For example, I'll have to pay municipal taxes. I'll have to uh, this, uh, respect the easements right available to the other persons. If you read section uh, uh, section 7 of the Eastman's Act, you will find that uh, Eastman natural rights, that uh, section 7 deals with natural rights. No, easements are restrictions on, restrictions on ownership. That is what the section itself says. Section 4 definition itself says. 
So absolute ownership is a concept in law because you have a right to enjoy, right to uh, possess, right to sell, right to mortgage, right to lease, whatever transactions in law permissible, uh, you can do that. And uh, you can, uh, what you call, sell out the property. Uh, you can make a gift, you can create a will. So these are all absolute, these are all incidents of absolute right, but still you have to follow certain uh, other laws or rather uh, other, other, uh, other, what you call conditions in enjoyment of property uh, uh, while you are enjoying the property. So theoretically there is an absolute right, but in practice your rights are controlled by other statutes and others rights. That is why we say that absolute right is only a myth. Yes, because the, Yes, sir. Now the next question is, in what manner the tenancy rights of a deceased tenant devolves on his, uh, his? No, see the tenancy right of a tenant, tenancy right, it can be in respect of a building tenancy or it can be in respect of a land, what immobile property, whatever it is. No, tenancy right is, as I told you earlier, it is a derivative right. Owner of the property or the, uh, we call it uh, owner of the property or a person having right title and interest over the property creates a lease in favor of a person who had no other right over the property prior to this creation. So only by virtue of a lease, the lessee gets a right over the property. Before that, he had no right. So such a person, uh, the leasehold right holder, the holder of a leasehold right, uh, suppose he dies, the, the leasehold right devolves on his legal heirs as one package because there was only one single person holding the right. The moment he breathes his last, that single person's right will devolve on the legal heirs. Say, assume that the tenant has two children and a wife. So uh, the, the whole tenancy will devolve on these uh, two uh, children and wife as one package and devolution of tenancy right is a joint tenancy. They, they are by, by devolution, a joint tenancy is created in favor of the legal heirs uh, of the deceased tenant. So the devolution is not in the form of ownership, but in the form of joint tenancy. This is a classic uh, distinction between ownership on one hand and joint tenancy on the other hand. Yes, because Yes, sir. So now uh, this is, what are the differences between the adverse possession and ouster? Yes, adverse possession is a concept if you refer to article 64 and 65 of the Indian Limitation Act, you will find that uh, the rights uh, lost after 12 years in respect of immobile property. Adverse possession means somebody holds your land with a hostile intention to exclude you from enjoyment. So uh, just one more aspect as uh, Mr. Vikas already asked me a question regarding absolute ownership. Absolute ownership is a concept where you can uh, have all the rights possession uh, saleability, all things are there. Apart from that, you have a right to exclude others from possession also. That is also a right possible. Not only that you can possess, but you can also exclude others from interfering with your possession. So, but in the case of adverse possession, suppose some, somebody trespasses upon another man's property and retains possession of the property for the statutory period of 12 years without allowing the owner of the property to enter or enjoy the property. Then after the period of 12 years, going by Article 65 of the Limitation Act, you get right over the property. So the right of the original owner is extinguished and that is give, that is uh, attached to the trespasser. Now that is called the concept of adverse possession. But in the case of cornership, the essential difference is that every corner is presumed to be owner of the property. For all practical purposes, he can hold the property and enjoy the same as if he is the full owner. But in the case of uh, uh, co-ownership, if you want to have a hostile right established against other co-owner or co-owners, then the it is the burden of the uh, co-owner claiming exclusive right to show that he has negated right of other co-owners, he has denied the right of other co-owners, he has uh, entered, re-entered the property with a hostile animus to others, uh, and to exclude them and uh, he has, uh, what do you call it, he has prescribed the right of uh, title, uh, he has prescribed the title to the property for holding it in a hostile position for more than 12 years. So the essential difference between a stranger trespasser 
claiming title by adverse possession and uh, a corner claiming right and title by adverse possession against other corners is that in the case of a stranger, there need not be ouster because ouster is a concept which under law is that the, the fact that you are holding it with a hostile animus, animus or that you are negating the right of other corners in the case of ouster has to be brought to the notice of the other corners. So you can't do it in a clandestine manner. You can do it in a what you call uh, stealthily you can do that. You have to by your gesture either by words or actions you must convey to the other corner that you are holding it as your own not on for and on behalf of the other corners and uh, there must be an express indication uh, going from you to the others that you are excluding them from your right so ouster is a thing which requires an uh, what you call which requires a, an express communication that you are negating is right but in the case of adverse possession that is not required because everyone is uh, uh, under a legal obligation uh, to consider to, to what you call be vigilant in respect of his property if somebody stranger transposes it up and you do not do anything within 12 years your right is lost but in the case of ownership, uh, since they have a dual relationship as equal owners the law requires that ouster which is a communication of your hostility to the other person in express terms which is not required in the case of strangers Yes. We'll just take the last question because I know that you are pressed with time. Can a co-owner seek eviction of a tenant from the leasehold? Yes. No, the co-owner, as I told you, is presumed to be uh, the absolute owner of the entire assets, entire property uh, for, all, for all practical purposes. Therefore, he can seek eviction of a tenant uh, uh, from the premises for and on behalf of other owners. But one rider is that he cannot claim that it is his exclusive property, it, he must recognize or respect the rights of other owners and he represents the whole body of the owners, joint owners or rather, sorry, he, let us use the correct expression, co-owners. He represents the, uh, the body of uh, co-owners and uh, he can seek eviction and that is covered by a direct decision of the Supreme Court uh, by Justice uh, B.R. Krishna here in 1976. That's a very interesting decision. Please refer to A.R. 1976 Supreme Court. I don't remember the page now which is uh, uh, clearly laying down the law and uh, dealing with the rights of corners in respect of seeking eviction from tenants. So, uh, thank you, sir, for sharing your knowledge. And those who are not subscribed to the channel, they can do that. And we will request that we have got all knowledgeable sessions of Justice A. Hari Prasad. You can watch them. They are on the playlist and even otherwise if you google with beyond loss he'll see so do stay connected with us thank you everyone and uh, thank you sir for sharing your knowledge and we keep on pressing you and you have always been kind enough to share your knowledge thank you thank you for the opportunity thank you